Man Visible and Invisible by C.W. Leadbeater Chapter 10 The Third Outpouring In order to understand the formation of the soul in man, there is another great factor which must be taken into account. This is the third outpouring of the divine life which comes from the first aspect of the Logos and makes within each man that distinctive spirit of the man which goeth upward, in contradistinction to the spirit of the beast which goeth downward, which, being interpreted, means that while the soul of an animal pours back after the death of the body into the group soul, or block to which it belongs, the divine spirit in man cannot so fall back again, but rises ever onward and upward towards the divinity from which it came. This third wave of life is represented by the band on the right in plate number three. And it will be noticed that in this case the outpouring does not become darker or more materialized as it proceeds. It appears to be unable of itself to descend lower than the buddhic plane, and there it hovers like a mighty cloud waiting for an opportunity of effecting a junction with the second outpouring, which is slowly rising to meet it. Although the cloud seems to exercise a constant attraction upon the essence below it, yet the development which makes the union a possibility must be made from below. The illustration usually given in the East to help the neophyte to comprehend this process is that of the formation of the water spout. There also we have a great cloud hovering over the sea on the surface of which waves are constantly forming and moving. Presently a great finger is extended from the cloud, an inverted cone of violently whirling vapor. And underneath this, a vortex is rapidly formed in the ocean, but instead of being a depression in its surface, as is the ordinary whirlpool, it is a whirling cone rising above that surface. Steadily, the two draw closer and closer together until they come so near that the power of attraction is strong enough to overleap the intervening space, and suddenly a great column of mingled water and vapor is formed where nothing existed before. In just the same way, the group souls of the animal kingdom are constantly throwing parts of themselves into incarnation, like the temporary waves on the surface of the sea, and the process of differentiation continues until at last a time comes when one of these waves rises high enough to enable the hovering cloud to effect a junction with it and it is then drawn up into a new existence, neither in the cloud nor in the sea, but between the two, and partaking of the nature of both. And thus it is separated from the group soul, of which hitherto it had formed a part, and falls back again into the sea no more. Anyone who has made a friend of a really intelligent domestic animal will readily understand how this happens, for he will have seen the intense devotion manifested by the animal for the master whom he loves, and the great mental efforts which he makes to understand his master's wishes and to please him. Obviously, both the animal's intellect and his power of affection and devotion will be enormously developed by these efforts, and the time will come when, in this way, he will raise himself so much above the general level of his soul group, group soul, that he will absolutely break away from it, and in doing so, become a fit vehicle for his third outpouring, by the junction of which the individual is formed, which thereafter follows its own course of evolution, back again to divinity. It is sometimes asked why, if the essence was divine in the beginning and returns again to divinity at the, he- at the end, If the human monad was all-wise and all-good when it started its long journey through matter, it was necessary for it to go through all this evolution, including, as it does, much sorrow and suffering, simply to return to its source in the end. But this question is based on a complete 
misconception of the facts, when what is sometimes, though perhaps inappropriately, called the human monad came forth from the divine, it was not a monad at all, still less an all-wise and all-good one. There was no sort of individualization in it. It was simply a mass of monadic essence. The difference between its condition when issuing forth, forth and when returning is exactly like that between a great mass of shining nebulous matter and the solar system which it eventually formed out of it. The nebula is beautiful, no doubt, but vague and useless. The sun, formed from it by its low evolution, slow evolution, pours life and heat and life and heat and light upon many worlds and its inhabitants and their inhabitants. Hmm. Or we may make another analogy. The human body is composed of countless millions of tiny particles, and some of them are constantly being thrown off of it. Suppose that we were, it were possible for each of these particles to go through some kind of an evolution by means of which it would, in time, become a human being. We should not say that because it had been, in a certain sense, human at the beginning of that evolution, and it had therefore not gained anything when it reached the end. The essence comes forth as a mere outpouring of force, even though it may be divine force. It returns in the form of thousands of millions of mighty adepts, each capable of himself developing into a logos. It is this wonderful course of evolution that we shall try to represent to a certain extent in our series of illustrations, though the most that we can do is to endeavor to portray the change that takes place in the various vehicles of man as he develops. Yet it is hoped that some idea of the progress may thus be conveyed to those who are yet, as yet unable to see it. There is one point in connection with the junction with which we have been trying to describe, which requires further explanation. A curious change has taken place in the position of the monadic essence. All the way through its long ages of evolution in all the previous kingdoms, it has invariably been the ensouling and energizing principle, the force behind whatever forms it might may have temporar the, may have temporarily occupied. <laughs> but now that which has hitherto been the ensouler becomes itself in turn the ensouled. From that monadic essence, which was part of the animal group soul, is now formed the causal body, a splendid ovoid form of living light into which the still more glorious light and life from above has descended, and by means of which the higher life is enabled to express itself as the human individuality. Nor should any think that it is an unworthy goal to reach as a result of so long and weary an evolution. Thus, to have become a vehicle of this last and grandest outpouring of the Divine Spirit, for it must be remembered that without the preparation of this vehicle to act as a connecting link, the immortal individuality of man could never have come into being. No fragment of the work has been done through all, the eight, through all these ages now, no fragment of the work with, which has been done through all these ages is lost and nothing has been useless, for the upper triad thus formed becomes a transcendent unity, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. Without that long course of evolution, this final consummation could never have been reached. That man should rise to the level of divinity, and that thus the very Logos himself should be made more perfect in that he has of his own offspring those upon whom that love which is the essence which is the essence of his divine nature has for the first time been fully lavished and by whom it can be returned a stage of development much in advance of the ordinary man is typified for us by the band on the extreme right of the diagram in plate 4. 
There we have the image of the highly spiritual man whose consciousness has already been evolved even beyond the causal body so that he is able to function freely upon the buddhic plane and has also a consciousness, at least when out of the body, upon a plane still higher than that, as is hinted by the white point. It will be seen that in the case of the center of consciousness, denoted by the widest part of this ribbon, is not all as is not at all as before upon the physical and astral planes, but lies between the higher mental and the buddhic. The higher mental and the higher astral are in him much more developed than their lower parts, and although he still retains his physical body, as is shown by the fact that the lower point of the band still reaches the lowest physical limit, yet this is only a point, which, which means that he holds his physical form merely for the convenience of working in it, and not in any way because his thoughts and desires are fixed there. He has long ago transcended all karma, which would bind him to incarnation. And if he now takes upon himself the vehicles of the lower planes, it's simply in order that through them he may be able to work for the good of humanity and to pour out at these levels of influence, uh, at these levels influence which would otherwise not which otherwise could not descend thereto hmm. okay let me read that last sentence again he has long ago transcended all karma which could bind him to incarnation and if he now takes upon himself the vehicles of the lower planes it is simply in order that through them he may be able to work for the good of humanity and to pour out at these levels influence which otherwise could not descend thereto. For the vibrations of certain types of divine force are in themselves too fine to be appreciated by the grosser essence of these lower planes. But if they descend to them through the channel of one whose vehicles at these levels are perfectly pure, then they can be appreciated even down here, and so their work may be done. When this causal body is newly formed, it is transparent yet iridescent, like a gigantic soap bubble. When viewed from the higher clair clairvoyant sight, that is to say, when examined at its own level by one who has fully developed the faculties of his own causal body, for it is only such a sight that it would be visible at all. But at this stage, it also resembles a soap bubble in being almost empty in appearance, for the divine force, which is really contained within it, has yet had no time to develop its latent qualities by learning to vibrate in response to impacts from without, and consequently, consequently there is little color. What little there is comes because certain qualities have already evolved within the group soul of which that causal body previously formed a part, and it is in process of communicating these to the force, force within, so that there is already a certain vibration at the rates corresponding to these, and consequently faint indications of these rates of vibrations are even now observable within the form as drawing gleams of color, no, as dawning gleams of color. Plate 5 will give us some idea of its appearance, or soon after, this stage. Plate 5 will give us some idea of its appearance at, or soon after, this stage, and it may be taken to represent the causal body of the primitive man. The gray shading at the left side of this illustration must not be taken as meaning any quality in the body. In fact, it is not really present in it at all but it's introduced by the artist simply to give the effect of rotundity to the bubble. But although the man now possesses a causal body, he's very far from being sufficiently conscious to receive or respond to impressions at that level. And since the appointed method for the evolution of his latent qualities is, as has been said, by means of impacts from without, it is obviously necessary that he should descend far enough 
to meet such impacts as can affect him. Therefore, it is the method of progress destined for him. Therefore, it is that the method of progress destined for him is that by reincarnation, that is to say, by putting forth part of himself into these lower planes for the sake of the experience to be gained there and of the qualities which that experience develops, and then withdrawing back again into himself, bearing with him the results of his endeavor. Indeed, this putting forth of the part of himself into reincarnation, I mean into incarnation, may not adeptly Okay, let me start that sentence again. Indeed, this putting forth of a part of himself into incarnation may not inaptly may be not inaptly likened to an investment. Hmm. He expects, if all goes well, to reclaim not only the whole of his capital, but also a considerable amount of interest, and he usually obtains this. But, as with other investments, there is occasionally an opportunity of loss as well as of gain, for it is possible that some portion of that that he puts down may become so entangled with the lower matter through which it has to work that it may be impossible wholly to reclaim it. The consideration of how this may happen hardly belongs to our present subject, but it will be found fully explained in the astral plane. And the astral plane is in italics here, so uh, it seems like that's a book, the title of a book. Okay, uh, the soul puts himself down under the impulse of what in the East is called Trishna, T-R-I-S-H-N-A, the thirst for manifested existence, the desire to feel himself alive. He plunges about in the sea of matter. He strengthens self by selfishness, and he shows himself to astral vision under the very unlovely guise depicted in Plate 7. Very gradually he learns that there is a higher evolution and that the strong shell of selfishness, which was necessary for the formation of the powerful center, becomes a hindrance to the growth of that center after it has once been formed, and so must be broken up and thrown aside, just as scaffolding must be removed when the building is finished, though it was necessary during its erection. Slowly, through many incarnations, his astral pres presentment, presentment develops from that of plate 7 to that of plate 10, and later still to that of plate 13. We shall try to follow this evolution and illustrate it at its different stages.